All right, guys, BLM here back with a new video. In this video, I'll be doing a bit of a different ranking here. Now, I did do my top 10 players of all time for Survivor US, and after doing that, I really had an itch to do a top one time players of all time ranking, as obviously a lot of the top players of all time are people who have played multiple times at this point. So I thought it'd be interesting to do my own like one time player ranking. However, after doing just some brainstorming for that list, I kind of realized that that list would have a good chunk of winners on it. Winners who have only played once. And at that point, I decided, you know what? Let's make another video out of this sort of idea. Let's make what I'm going to be doing here, my top 10 non-winning one time players of all time for Survivor. I will also be doing my one-time player list that includes the winners later on, but for now we'll only be talking about the non-winning one-time players. I just thought this was an interesting list to put together because a lot of the best players of Survivor have already played again. There are very few players that are looked at as truly great players that have not come back for another season. So I thought this sort of concept, especially adding in the non-winning element of it made this a pretty interesting list however full disclosure here there are a lot of players from the 30s of survivor obviously that's the era that hasn't had as many opportunities to have a return at this point and to be honest some of the people on this list will probably end up returning to survivor at some point but we're in the aftermath of survivor 40 i just feel like it's a good spot in survivor history to do a video like this so while a lot of these players will probably return at some point I think this is a good breakoff point to do this video. And also, I'm not going to do a list of top 10 non-winning one-time players from the pre-30s of Survivor. Like, that's just completely ridiculous. So we're just going to leave it as is. So I've mentioned this before. I rank my players based on how well I feel like they would do on multiple returns. Mixing that in with, obviously, what we've seen throughout their actual seasons that would help support that. So obviously we got a lot to talk about, so let's just jump right into the honorable mentions. Let's go through it in chronological order. Someone I really wanted to put on the list was T-Bird. I think she's someone that had so much potential on her season. Someone that was willing to flip on her alliances. Due to optimal move for her game, was able to flip over Kelly Goldsmith once Lex isolated her. And if she had been able to keep Brandon on her side, she probably ends up winning that season. I considered a few people from Survivor Vanuatu. I considered Twyla, I considered Scout, and I considered Julie Barry. All three of them, I think, are pretty solid players. Probably Twyla, to be honest, to be the worst of the bunch. I do think she completely misunderstood jury management in that season. Despite having a decent mind for the strategic game, I do think she was kind of dragged along a bit, but I at least considered her. Scout is someone that I think gets kind of underrated in history of Survivor. I mean, she is the one that came up with the plan to blindside Leanne at the final seven. And if she does get to the end with Twyla, she does end up winning that season. But again, how likely is it that she'll get that far in most seasons? I don't think it is that likely. And with Julie Berry, I think Julie Berry is the prototype for poverty. I think she is the flirtatious young girl that good with almost everybody. I think she just lacks a killer instinct, and that's why she didn't make the list. I consider Natalie Bolton, who I think is a really cutthroat player. Obviously, was a major part in the Eric blindside in Micronesia. But the reason why she's not on the list is because I don't feel like she wins in any scenario on that season. I struggle to find a single final two that she wins. Just not really in the cards for her to win that season. So I didn't really consider her here. I considered Kenny from Gabon. I think Kenny is a really fun player, but I just feel like he acts too emotionally at points. I feel like he overplays his hand. I mean, what he did at the Corinne boot was just completely asinine. So while I do think he has a decent strategic mind for the game, I think he just enacts his plans too emotionally and also just has too much confidence in his actual ability to really be on the list. From Token Chains, I could say Taj. The problem with Taj is that I feel like she didn't really want to win the game. She was kind of more willing to give up the game for JT and Steven. She was willing to go to the final three just to be cut by them. And also, I think when really analyzing her game, I kind of realized that she was a lot more passive of a player than I realized. I actually have a decent amount of contenders here from Survivor Nicaragua. I have Chase, Sash, Holly, and Marty. Now, is Marty that great of a player? Probably not. I just love Marty, so I wanted to at least consider him. The problem with Marty, though, is I think he's too outwardly in front and too outwardly strategic to the point where he's going to have a tough road 
actually being in control for an entire season. I feel like that's the only way he does get to the end. So again, not super confident in his ability overall. Holly is someone that I actually am pretty impressed by when I reanalyzed her game. I think she is someone that was able to maneuver around many scenarios, had a very solid group. I think the problem with Holly is that she doesn't win in most scenarios. I mean, if she got to the end in the scenario that she wanted, which was her assassin chase, Chase ends up winning the season. I mean, that's been confirmed by the jury. So it's like, despite her having so much ability in the game, I just don't know if she can win the game. Obviously, I consider Sash. Sash is just too schemy, right? Too snaky in the game. I mean, he just came off very transactional. I don't think anyone really respected his game. I don't think he wins in any scenario. I mean, I do think there are scenarios where he could get votes from people like Marty, maybe Brenda, but it's like he's never winning that season. And obviously then we got Chase Rice. I really like Chase Rice's game. I've said that before in my runner-up ranking. I think he played one of the best runner-up games in the history of Survivor. But overall as a player, I don't feel as confident about him. I, I think he does come off as kind of a doofus at points to the point where I think he loses respect from the jury. I mean, that's a lot of the reason why he didn't get the votes of like Dan Lembo and Marty. And he was just like made fun of at Final Tribal because of that. Despite him, again, he played a very dominant game. He was a central figure in the majority alliance. Him, Holly, and Jane ran that game and pulled in Sash. And Chase does win at the end if he's in his actual scenario that he wanted to be in. So again, I do have a lot of confidence in his game. But overall, as a player, I don't know how well he would do on any random season. Um, I feel like his normal run on Survivor is essentially Cole Metters from HHH. And I think he did get very lucky with the type of positioning that he was given on that season that allowed him to dominate the game. I think on most seasons, he's not going to get that. So that's why he didn't make the list for me, though he was pretty close. From One World, I did consider Chelsea Meisner as she was obviously the second command to Kim, who is one of the best players of all time. And Chelsea is also someone that is just so naturally likable. She was well liked by the jury. The problem is that she wasn't well respected by the jury, especially in comparison to Kim. The question for me is, is she ever really going to get the respect of the jury? So because of that, that's why she didn't make the list. After that, we got Lisa Welchel. And Lisa Welchel, kind of similarly to Holly for me, I, I think she has a lot of skill for the game. I think she knows the game pretty well. And I think her trying to blindside Malcolm at various points in the season was obviously indicative of that. However, the problem for Lisa is, again, I, I just don't know if she gets the respect from a jury. On most seasons, mind you, if she does get to the end with her scooping and Abby, she does win that season. However, that was a scenario she actively threw away. She actively voted out Abby. So because of that, I don't feel like she has the killer instinct in the game to win the game. She didn't make the list because of that. I consider Josh Canfield from San Juan del Sur. The problem with him is obviously he got booted way too early. I think he had so much potential in the game, is a very savvy player, was able to run his initial tribe, but I think he was too out in front. So while I do think he has a lot of ability in the game, I don't think he was able to manage that very well his first time around. Though if he were to return on a future season, I think he could do pretty well. From Korong, I considered Sydney and... Sydney's another one that I think has so much potential in the game, very good strategic mind for the game, was able to flip on her alliances when she needed to, was in a position to make it to the end if Michelle had not won that final immunity challenge. And if she gets to the end against her, Ty, and Aubrey, I think she gets some votes. Does she win? Probably not. I mean, it's always been disputed who wins that final three scenario, though if you were to put a gun to my head, I would say Sydney probably has the least chance of winning that final three scenario. And I think that's the problem with Sydney's game is that she blindsided almost everyone that was on the jury to the point where they were actively bitter against her. I mean, obviously that Julia, Scott, and Jason group was bitter against her. I could see Debbie being bitter against her due to her blindsiding her. And I could see the Neil and Nicks of the world voting for Aubrey, obviously, over Sydney. So I think she was in a very bad spot to win the game. So again, that's why she didn't make the list for me. This is going to be a controversial one. Uh, from HHH, I considered Chrissy and I considered Ryan. Mind you, they were literally number 11 and 12 on the list. Um, mind you, I had Ryan at 11, which I know people won't agree with. But I think Chrissy and Ryan are both very strong players. If Ben had not been saved by that Final Four flyer making, one of those two might have won that season. And they were, again, they were so close to making the list. This is the thing with Chrissy, and I know people keep on talking about, oh my god, you hate Chrissy and stuff because of my... Place him on the runner-up ranking, and I will full disclosure, I fully regret that positioning. I do think she should have been moved up 
at least a tier. I think essentially I think she should have been right below Carolyn. That's kind of where I would have placed her if I were to redo the list. Which puts her around like what the 19 sort of spot. But either way, Chrissy is someone that obviously has a good mind for the game. Very decent strategically. She's obviously very good at challenges. I think she lacks something majorly in the social game. There were so many people during that season that just talked about not liking her. Especially a lot of the people from the opposition. I think she's very good at building a core group. I mean, her, Ryan, JP, add in Ben earlier on in the game. I think she had very strong relationships there. The problem is that she very much isolates the people outside of her alliance. The Jessica, the Desis, the Joes, the Cole Metters. Those people did not like her. While Joe keeps on changing his mind on who he would have voted for in that final Tribal Council, I do fully believe he would have voted for Ryan. I mean, he said that immediately after the season. It's only now, years later, that he's saying, oh my god, I would have voted for Chrissy. I just don't feel like Chrissy had any respect from that minority group on that season. And that minority group was a good chunk of the jury there. I think she's the least likely winner in that original final three scenario of Chrissy, Ryan, and Devin. As the only votes I can see Chrissy getting are Mike and possibly JP. But then again, JP didn't even vote for her against Ben, who was someone that he didn't have that great of a relationship with. But again, I don't think Chrissy's a bad player. Like, she was number 12 on this list initially when I made the list. So it's like she was close to making it on. I just find Ryan to be a better player, to be honest. And Ryan was number 11 on the list. I think, again, the problem for Ryan, though, is I think he was a bit more passive in the end game of that season, which I think is a major downside for him. As, again, I think he played very strong in the pre-merge. And even earlier on in the merge. But I think once the JP blindside happens, I think he's just kind of stumbling around for a bit, but then kind of lucks his way into a pretty solid position. Again, if he gets to the end against Devin and Chrissy, it's him and Devin fighting for jury votes at that point from that minority group. He does have the vote of Ben. I think he has a great point if he gets that final scenario where two of his closest allies in Chrissy and Devin, who had no connective tissue between them, got to the end along with him, which makes him look like the centerpiece within that group. I think he has a very good shot of winning that season. I just feel like he was a bit too passive at points. Just barely missed the cut for me, but I do look at Ryan as a pretty good player of Survivor. From David vs. Goliath, I did consider Davey. Problem with Davey is that I just feel like he missed something. And I really don't know exactly what it is, but it just felt like Nick was so much better positioned than him. I think a lot of that has to do with Nick being very well positioned with Mike who's kind of running the show at that point, while Davey never really had that connection. And I think through that was just kind of on the outs there, obviously by the final six. Well, I do think he has, again, a very good strategic mind for the game. I do love what he did with playing the idol on Christian at the final 12. I think he's a ballsy player and someone that is going to make moves when he has to. But at the same time, I think he just missed a little something in terms of positioning that made him barely miss out on the list. Again, he was pretty close to making it on the list as well. And final contenders here come from Edge of Extinction, and there's actually a few. I considered Ron, I considered War Dog, and I considered Rick Devins. Ron's another one that I think has a good strategic mind for the game. I think he just completely lacked positioning. I think he misread his position on the tribe. I think by getting rid of War Dog and Kelly Wentworth, some of these moves that he made previously, like it just left him way too vulnerable. He was the biggest threat available at that point. I think that's a major knock against him. Again, he, could he fix it for a return? Probably, but... Based on the information that we have, I don't feel like he makes the list. War Dog is another, it's like kind of a similar thing. I think he has one of the best strategic minds for a game. I was actually mind blown at how well he knew the strategic game of Survivor, but I think he lacked things socially. I mean, it didn't seem like people actually liked him from a social standpoint. And then also, again, his positioning was pretty terrible. I mean, the fact that he blindsides Kelly Wentworth so early, I think he should have waited probably until round final seven or so to make that move. I think it left him way too vulnerable at that point. And Rick Devins, I mean, the thing about Rick Devins is that if he gets to the end of that season, obviously he wins in a unanimous vote, right? I think that's something that you can't really ignore. The fact that he was able to scrape his way all the way to the end of that season. And even when he gets voted out at the fourth Tribal Council of the season, that was kind of a fluke thing. I mean, obviously he was positioning himself for a swap. That's why he didn't blindside Kelly Wentworth earlier on is because he thought coming into the swap, it's better to keep numbers with Lauren, Wardog, and Kelly Wentworth. But he kind of gets screwed over by the swap, getting swapped into the exact same group minus his filler in Wendy. And that really just screws him over, which the odds of that are so unlikely. So I know a lot of people discredit him for being voted out. And I mean, obviously I would have if he had won the game. Uh, that's terrible for his winning game. 
But as a player, it's not that big of a knock for me as it was such a random scenario to occur. The bigger knock for me is that he was really terrible at managing his threat level where he needed the fine idols, he needed the win challenges, and that's not great in my eyes. Though the fact that he was able to do those things is impressive, but when we have players that didn't need those things on the list, but could also still do those things, I just felt like it was kind of tough putting Rick Devins on the list. Though again, he was somewhat close to making the list. It was him, Davey, Ryan, and Chrissy that were like on the border of making it onto the list. And that's all the honorable mentions. I can't believe I talked that long just about the honorable mentions, but whatever. Let's move on to the actual list. The top 10 non-winning one-time players of Survivor. And now at number 10 is someone that I thought was going to be very high on the list. When I initially concepted this video, I thought this player would be like number three or four. This is actually the person that originally made me think of this list. I remember back in around Survivor 30 when I was thinking of this very idea. I was thinking, oh yeah, this person's definitely going to be number one. And then we come to this list now and this person's at number 10. And at number 10 here, we have Hayden Moss from Blood vs. Water. And the thing about Hayden is Hayden made an incredible move at the Rock Draw Tribal Council. The fact that he was able to scrape his way out of that, get Sierra to flip, get through that tribal, and if he had won that Rock Draw, I think he more than likely wins the game. He's also very well positioned earlier on in the game, being kind of the third or fourth person within that Brad Culpepper alliance, so someone that wouldn't be targeted outright, but also someone that was still within the majority. However, do you think he fades a bit in the early merge? I think it's more so in a way where he just becomes way too passive. Obviously, the Aris blind side was something that was very beneficial for him. But after that, getting rid of Vetus is something that isn't really in his best interest. And eventually, when they get rid of Laura Moret as well, like that's not really something that's good for his positioning. I mean, look at his position on the tribe. It was so clear that he was going to be set up for the final seven. And at the final seven, he would need to flip against Tyson. He, obviously, he recognized that. The problem is that he didn't manage that well. He lost Sierra. I mean, like, the fact that he loses Sierra in that position, such a pivotal position, and ends up losing his closest ally in Caleb after and ends up being down the numbers after that to the point where he needs to go to Rocks at the final six, that's terrible. I mean, like... I find it so impressive that he was able to convince Sierra to go to Rocks. I think he was very well positioned throughout a lot of the game. I just think he lacked the foresight in that early merge to position him well for that end game. And him losing Sierra to Tyson is something that should have never happened to a high caliber player of Survivor. So that's kind of the biggest knock for Hayden for me. I do feel like he was too passive there. Though again, he does come very close to winning the game. If that rock draw goes his way, he's in a final three with him, Sierra, and Katie. And the only thing that really could have knocked him out of that is the return of Tina that could have possibly made it so that he gets kicked out over Tina. But even then, I still have a lot of confidence in Hayden winning that season if that was the case. But I think he actively made the mistakes to get himself in that position. And I wouldn't be surprised if he made those mistakes again on a return. So for me, he's here at number 10. And number 9 is someone that I didn't think would be this high on the list, if I'm being honest. And I'm kind of debating it in my head if this was the right choice to put her this high. Though I was very impressed by her game when the season was airing. And from the Edge of Extinction, the highest person from the Edge of Extinction is Victoria. And again, Victoria is someone that played a very sleeper game. A game that I was actually very impressed by. Again, someone that was able to get trust from almost everybody earlier on in the game. And was able to blindside Aubrey with an idol and an extra vote in her pocket. I think that was very impressive. Her positioning in the game was very strong earlier on where she was within that majority, but again, not a central figure within that majority to be actively targeted by the minority. Coming to the merge, she was always with the majority. No matter what happened, mind you, she wasn't necessarily in control of the majority, but I think she was very flexible in the game that allowed her to stay within the majority. Though I do disagree with like her move to get rid of Eric. I think that was a bit too early. But she was a scrappy player, someone that was able to recover from bad positions. Like after the Julia boot, where it looked like she was on the bottom, she was able to get back within the majority. I think the problem for her is that she wasn't able to manage Gavin correctly. I mean, kind of similarly to how Hayden lost Sierra, 
Victoria lost Gavin to Lauren, and I feel like that's a major knock against her for me, as that really became the deal breaker for her game. Because if she had Gavin on her side, she would have been in a very solid position in that endgame, though, to be fair, she would have gotten screwed over by Chris returning either way. But again, that's an outside circumstance. If it was that original Final Five, Victoria was going home anyway, and a lot of that had to do with Gavin having flipped on her. So that is the biggest knock against her game for me, but again, I was just so impressed with how she was able to maneuver the game be a decision maker at points, be a manipulator at points. And because of that for me, I was very impressed by her. She's here at number nine. Now for number eight is another player that I was kind of a bit hesitant on just because I don't think we've ever gotten solid proof on how the game would have ended for this person. But from Island of the Idols, I have Lauren Beck. And again, the problem with Lauren Beck is we never really got proof that she wins if she gets to the end. Because from what the show portrayed, it seems like that's the case. However, I remember at the time of that finale, there was like information coming out that was saying that Lauren wasn't as well respected by the jury as it seemed. So I'm really not sure what to do with Lauren, but she did play a dominant game either way. I mean, her along with Tommy dominated that entire merge stretch of the game. She was in a very good position initially on her tribe where she pulls off that Molly blind side. If it wasn't for Elaine having that block of vote, she would have been in a very strong position in that post swap tribe. She was able to build relationships with a lot of the players like Elaine and Missy. And I think she was very good overall in the game. I just feel like she was completely outplayed by Tommy. I feel like she just, again, missed something positioning wise where Tommy was able to completely outplay her building bonds with the Dean and Janets of the world that seemed like Lauren didn't have as great a relationship with. But also Tommy just manipulated Nora at that final four round that caused Lauren to go to fire making and she just couldn't survive that either. So I think she has, again, major knocks against the game. I mean, all these people have major knocks against the game because they've all lost the game. Now, if Lauren, though, it's like she could possibly move up if it comes out that it was guaranteed she was going to win that final tribal council. I don't feel like that's the case, though. If you put a gun to my head, I'm thinking, I think Tommy beats her in the final three. Now, does she win if Tommy's not there? Yeah, I do think that's the case. But she wanted to go to the end with Tommy, and in that scenario, I don't know if she wins. So for now, Lauren places here at number eight, though if there were more information to come out, she could possibly move up, but I don't feel like that's really the case. Now at number seven, we actually have the highest ranked woman on this list, and I think this is also the thing with female players on Survivors. I feel like a lot of the better female players on Survivor have played again at this point and that's what kind of made this list kind of tough as well especially because people keep on calling me sexist in the comments with certain lists i'm still going to be genuine to how i actually look at these people's games but the highest ranked woman on the list here is carolyn from worlds apart and carolyn's just someone again when reanalyzing her game i was actually very impressed with her flexibility within the game. The fact that she was initially on the majority on that white collar tribe, she was able to find an idol right away. But then once Shireen and Max got too close, she was instantly able to flip on them, but was still able to ingratiate herself within the majority to where she wasn't a target afterwards. Coming to the merge, she was very good at, again, integrating herself within the majority. Her and Tyler were able to team up with Will and Rodney, and they ran a lot of that early merge section of the game. I do think she loses control though towards the end game where she does start to become a target and obviously she does need to play that idol at the Dan boot and that's not particularly great overall. But again, her sheer flexibility in the game is something that I was always impressed by. She's able to suss out that Sierra is going home despite no one actually telling her that's the plan and is able to vote correctly there. She builds a very strong relationship with Mike Holloway that ends up carrying her to the end of the game which is another thing that I do find pretty impressive. Again, she knew when to make moves and she knew were the correct moves to make. I mean, the Tyler move at the final seven is kind of a hazy one. I, I do question that move, especially because she does get targeted the very next tribal. I do think she did that maybe a round too early, but she's able to think strategically for herself. She's able to go outside of the bounds of her alliance to build bonds with other people. Somehow always able to find her way within the majority group. I do think a knock against her though is that 
I don't know how likely it is she wins that season. I mean, if she is in the end against her, Rodney, and Will, I do think it is close between her and Rodney. I think she certainly gets votes there. Yeah, I have a lot of confidence in her ability in the game, her flexibility within the game, or her strategic thinking within the game. So for me, she still lands here at number seven. Now at number six, we have another person from Survivor Worlds Apart, and I think this person is someone that's a bit underrated in the grand scheme of Survivor, and that is Rodney. And Rodney was such a big surprise on that season. He was someone that I was thinking was a complete joke coming into that season, but he somehow played an extremely dominant game. I mean, from the merge on, he's in that majority group and is the one making decisions for that majority group. And a lot of the reason why he ends up losing the game is because Mike Holloway goes on that immunity run, which again was such an unlikely situation to happen. That guy would win five out of six immunities and also have an idol at the one time that he was vulnerable again that was such an unlikely situation and if it wasn't for that situation I do think it's very likely Rodney wins that season if he gets the end with him Carolyn and Will I think there's a very good chance he gets votes there especially if he was able to get into the scenario that he initially wanted which was him Dan and Will which would have been a possibility if Carolyn didn't have an idol at the final six I was very impressed with Rodney's positioning in the game again always being able to stick with the majority group outside of the Joaquin boot, but even then, Joaquin was taken out because he was so close to Rodney. I think he has a good strategic mind for the game, and to be honest, I don't really have that many inherent knocks against his game, outside of the fact that he couldn't win a challenge against Mike Holloway, or he couldn't nullify Carolyn's idol, or he couldn't save Dan at the final six. I mean, outside of those things, I don't really have that big of a knock against him. Though that's with me thinking that he wins in a final three scenario. For all I know, he probably loses. And if that's the case, then obviously he would drop significantly on this list. But I do suspect that he wins a final three scenario against him and Carolyn. I think he definitely wins against him and Dan and Will. So for me, I have him at number six for now. But again, this is obviously subject to change if more information was out there. Now number five is someone from one of the earlier seasons on the list. And someone that I was so impressed by. When I initially watched Guatemala, however, this person just has such massive flaws in their game, and that is Rafe Judkins. And Rafe dominated that season from beginning to end. Literally dominated the entire way through, was a major decision maker within the majority the entire way through, was the central figure of the majority from the merge on. The problem with Rafe is that he just plays too emotionally. I think he made moves just because he didn't like certain things that were happening. I think he made the move against Cindy at the final five just because he didn't like how she was acting with the car. And I don't think that's a particularly great mindset for a dominant player in a game. I and mean, this is the thing. He was a dominant player, but I think he made the wrong decisions while dominating. He obviously took Danny as far as he did. He's in his mind in that final three scenario. He thinks Danny takes him and he thinks Stephanie takes him. I think the major knock against his logic there though is if he goes against Danny he loses six to one and there's no real shot for him to even get any other jury votes so I do think that's a major knock against him that he does take Danny as far as he does if he takes Lydia instead of Danny it's almost guaranteed that Lydia loses that final immunity challenge especially because height was such a major factor in that challenge that more likely Lydia loses Stephanie wins she votes out Lydia takes Rafe to the end Rafe wins that season and it's really just one major decision that he makes in not taking out Danny at the final four that cost him the game where again Danny was just so much more likely to win final immunity than Lydia and Danny is someone that beats him so mixing that in with a lot of the personal decisions that he seemed to make a lot of the emotional decisions he seemed to make with taking out Cindy taking out Jamie even like I just felt like there were decisions that he made that weren't for the betterment of his game those are the major knocks against Rafe for me again outside of that I think he's a very savvy strategic player he's very good at challenges he's a very social player was able to bond with almost everyone on that season but I do think he was just simply outplayed by Danny at that end game and that's why he ranks here at number five instead of possibly even ranked number two or three now moving on to number four, and number four is someone that I kind of forgot about, to be honest, when making this list. I, I forgot that this person would be so high. And number four here, I have Mike White, and I love Mike White's game. I- I've talked about this in my runner-up ranking. I think he played an extremely dominant game, especially in the end game of that season. 
I think he's someone that has one of the best social games in the history of Survivor. Everyone that talks about Mike White from that season just absolutely adores him. The biggest knock for Mike White for me, though, is that he doesn't seem to want to win the game. And that's the problem, is that he's kind of a, like a Dr. Will figure for me, where it's like it's so unsure of whether or not he actually wants to win the game. And because that, I don't have that much confidence in putting him super high on the list because of that. I mean, he's someone that pretty much threw away his game at Final Tribal to Nick. Now, does Nick win anyway? Probably, but... It was like he wasn't really trying that much. He pretty much told them to give the win to Nick, and that's not great. Though I do find it very impressive how dynamic of a social game he was able to play. And if Nick had not won out on that season, and if Mike had been willing to cut Nick, Mike wins that season. If Mike gets the end against Angelina and Kara, he wins that season. If he gets the end against Allison, I think he has a good shot to win that season. I mean, I think he is someone that could have easily won that season if he really wanted to. I just don't know if he wanted to. And mixing that in also with the fact that I do think he has a bit of a tougher road earlier on in the game where I do think he could be a target coming into the first Tribal Council that season. That's kind of why he places here at number four. Now I'm number three. We have someone that I adored on his season, someone that I definitely thought at the time was one of the best players to not win. So from HHH, I have Devin Pinto. And I was so impressed with his game at the time, especially because he obviously came in as this like surfer bro sort of guy, a guy that didn't look super strategic, but he did very well in the game. I mean, he was within the majority initially on in his tribe, builds a really strong bond with Ashley in the post swap. Post merge, he's again within the majority group where the hustlers and the heroes come together, but is also able to flip on that group when he needed to. I mean, he was able to build that counter alliance along with Lauren Rimmer, who was actually the orchestrator of that. But him, Lauren, Ashley, and Ben pretty much run that middle section of the game and doing all that while still looking like a lesser threat than someone like Lauren and Ashley. To where while they were getting taken out after they lost the numbers, he was still in a very solid position. He was able to re group and build that bond with Chrissy and Ryan that could have carried him to the end of the game and would have carried him to the end of the game if this had been a natural season. The final four fire making obviously ruins that chance where Ben beats him at fire making, he gets taken out at four, but in a normal circumstance Ben gets voted out there and he's in the final three with Chrissy and Ryan where I do think he has a very good chance of winning. Does he win? I don't know. If you Again, if you're really going to make me make a call, I do think Ryan wins that final three. And that is why I look at Ryan's game higher than a lot of other people. But I think Devin definitely would have had a shot. I think he would have de- needed to do some convincing of like the Desi, Cole, and Joes of the world. But I do think there is a chance he wins that season. And we obviously have his move at the final five, which I forgot to mention, where he saves himself by throwing a vote on Mike. That's also another impressive move. Not just the fact that he put the vote on Mike, but also the fact that Chrissy and Ryan voted to keep him over Mike, I think is also another impressive element of that. Overall, I mean, I just love Devin's game. I mean, he was a very surprisingly great strategic player of the game. I mean, he was able to create plans for that Ben group. I mean, he was the one that told Ben to go sabotage on the... He was the one that told Ben to be a spy within that other group that allowed them to get the information that they needed to pull off the Joe blindside at the final eight. We see him willing and dealing at that Lauren tribal where he's the one going around and trying to convince people to take out Ben, which seemed to have worked until Ben obviously played his idol. I mean, like overall, I am very, very impressed with Devin's game as a whole. The only knock against him for me is that I don't know if he wins if he gets to the end. And that's the reason why he's here at number three. But I do think he would have had a very good shot against anyone other than Ben. Now, number two, we have someone that I think is a very similar player to Devin, though a bit probably more out in front. And one of the older players on this list, from Survivor Palau, we have Ian Rosenberger. And Ian played an extremely dominant game on that season. I mean, obviously, a lot of the credit now goes to Tom. But I think something that people fail to remember is that Tom lost control of the game in that end game. Like, when Karen goes home, Tom is in a terrible position for the final four and final three to the point where he needs to win out while ian directly assessed that he needed to get rid of tom he was able to flip on tom at the final four and if it wasn't for tom winning those immunities tom goes home at final four and ian's in a very good spot to win that final immunity and win the game if he gets to the end of the game against anyone but tom ian wins that game hands down and even if he's at the end against tom i think it's a very close vote there where 
depending on how they perform at Final Tribal, I do think there's a chance Ian could pull it out there. He's a very good challenge competitor, someone that, despite being a very good challenge competitor, was never really targeted. The only reason he's targeted at the Final Four, where he has to go to fire making, is because Tom wins immunity and the information leaks out because of that, that Ian was targeting Tom. And that's what caused that fire making. But even then, he was able to keep Katie on his side to the point where they went to fire making. I mean, for me, I don't really have that major of a knock against Ian's game outside of the fact that he gives up the game at the final three. I mean, that's really the biggest thing. And that's obviously a major knock. And the reason why he's not number one, to be honest, I considered putting him at number one. But it's really that decision at the final three that has to knock him down. I mean, as much as I love Ian's game, him deciding to essentially quit the game to keep his friendship with Tom is completely asinine from a strategic standpoint. Thing is, though, I don't think Ian was thinking strategically, obviously. So, I mean, that obviously changes things. But it's like still, as a player, on a player ranking, if I can't count on you to think strategically at the final three, I don't know how much confidence I can really have in you as a player overall. And I find almost everything he does before that extremely impressive. The fact that he was able to be the second command to Tom the entire way through, but knew exactly when he needed to flip on him and really just only gets screwed over due to Tom's challenge wins. Because if we really think about it, that final three scenario doesn't happen if Tom doesn't win final four immunity. If Tom doesn't win final four immunity, Tom gets voted out final four and it doesn't even matter. Ian wins the game. So Ian is someone that I do have a lot of respect for. And because he does rank here at number two, I just found it really tough to squeak him into the number one spot. Now at number one, and this should be pretty obvious, right? I mean, I think there's a major person I have not talked about yet. And at number one, I have Dominic Abate. And it has to be him, right? I mean, I, I think the more I really think about it, it has to be him. Even though I do have some knocks against his game. I mean, earlier on in the game, he wasn't super well positioned. He did come off as kind of too scatterbrained. And the fact that he openly targets Chris like very early on that season isn't great. The fact that that group was possibly going to rocks if they went the tribal is completely crazy as well. So at the same time, you got to give credit to Dominic that despite all the craziness, he was still able to be within a five person alliance, but he does also get blindsided the Morgan vote again. All that's not great, but he completely runs the game after that. I mean, like from immediately after the Morgan vote where he's able to pull in Donathan and Laurel, he never loses control from that point on. I think he was a very solid strategic player being able to make moves when he needed to knew when to make the right moves the problem is that he just again wasn't given the opportunity I mean he easily wins the season if he gets Wendell out at around final four final five it's just he couldn't do it and a lot of that had to do with Wendell either winning immunity or having an idol or the fire making challenge there were just things that were against him that I think made it so he couldn't win and even in that scenario he comes into final tribal with five guaranteed votes where he just need one more vote to pull out the win and he just couldn't scrape by so again he does have those faults in the early game but i do feel like almost everything after that is so impressive the move at the final six despite it possibly losing him jury votes i think is very impressive that he was able to somehow convince sebastian not to use his extra vote and not put votes on Dominic. That's impressive. I think really the only thing strategically in the that end game that you can really fault him for is not giving up immunity at the final four to take on Wendell in the fire making challenge. Which if he wins that fire making challenge, he obviously wins the game. Though if he loses that fire making challenge, he's obviously out. And considering Dominic obviously had a very good chance in the final tribal council anyway, I don't think that was even the right move to make. As again, he was literally only one vote away from winning. I mean, he literally had five guaranteed votes coming into that trouble he just needed to flip one more and just simply wasn't able to do it so that's another thing that i think he could have done that i don't think many people have talked about is that what if he gave immunity to angela where instead of making angela go and fire against wendell he makes laurel go and fire against wendell which in turn makes angela more loyal to him which in the scenario that eventually happens which is a tie vote which would have happened anyway because angela initially voted for wendell which in this scenario, Laurel obviously votes for Wendell anyway, which means that we still get a tie. But in this situation, Angela is the deciding vote. And she's someone that at this point has more reason to vote for Dominic. Especially because her real reason for voting for Wendell in the initial tribal is because she looked up and Wendell was looking at her or something dumb like that. So obviously her vote was completely up for grabs. And I feel like this would have clinched him the win if that had happened. Though, again, how could he have known that scenario? But overall, again, like, how do you not have Dominic? At number one here i mean he came so close to winning the game he was literally one vote away got the closest you can possibly be and also dominated a majority of that season 
there's no way he couldn't be number one here. So there we go. Those are my top 10 non-winning one-time players in Survivor. <laughs> As I said, I will be doing a one-time player ranking somewhere down the road. Obviously more Survivor videos and whatever else to come as well. That's the video. That's my ranking of the non-winning one-time players. Thank you for watching.